Good afternoon, and thank you for standing by, and welcome to the fourth quarter fiscal year 2020 earnings call. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, to please disconnect at this time. Your lines are in a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's conference. At that time, you may press star followed by the number one to ask a question. Please unmute your phones and state your first and last name when prompted. It is now my pleasure to turn the conference over to Jonathan Ornstein, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer. Sir, you may begin. Thank you very much, Operator. Sorry for the delay, guys. We're all uh, working remotely, as you can imagine, so technically uh, trying to get everyone on the same page, but we appreciate your patience. Um, this is Jonathan Ornstein. I'm the Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Mesa Airlines. On the call with me today is Mike Lotz, our President and Chief Financial Officer, Brian Gilman, our Executive VP and General Counsel, and Brad Rich, our Chief Operating Officer. I'd like to open up with our forward-looking statement for the presentation and the comments begin. Mace would like to remind you that some of the statements in response to your questions in this conference call may include forward-looking statements. As such, they are subject to future events and uncertainties that could also affect our results to differ materially from those statements. Also, please note the company undertakes no obligation to update revi or revise these forward-looking statements. Any forward-looking statements should be considered in conjunction with the cautionary statements in our press release and the risk factors including included in our filings with the SEC, which Mesa encourages you to read. In addition, please refer to our press release in the investor section of Mesa's website to find additional disclosure and reconciliations of non-GAAP financial measures that will be used on today's call. Okay, I really want to start the call uh, with a big thanks to all of our people in the field who, despite the obvious risks, have continued to exhibit incredible bravery and dedication in their service to our passengers. Uh, that dedication is in the face of the pandemic, I believe is nothing short of outstanding. I'd like to thank each of our pilots, flight attendants, mechanics, operations control personnel, and all the other frontline employees. Uh, while this may well be an example of the darkest hour before dawn, we remain optimistic that our country and our industry will recover in 2021. Thank you, everybody. Despite the challenges in the industry, Mesa has focused on our core business and has secured some important opportunities going forward. I'd like to walk you through some of our key accomplishments for the year. We started off 2020 expanding our United CPA, which we signed in November 2019 for 20 incremental Embraer 175 aircraft as well extending our 42 existing Embraer 175s for five years and to lease 20 of our older CRJ 700s to another United Express operator for seven years. Ten of those Embraer 175s are already flying for United, with six additional aircraft scheduled for delivery this month and the remaining four in the first half of calendar year 2021. In April 2020, we applied for the PSP program and received $95.2 million, allowing us to retain all of our employees who would likely have been furloughed otherwise due to the significant reduction in our level of operations. These expenses are normally paid by our partners through the CPA. In our June quarter, we were the only publicly traded U.S. carrier to report a profit and have achieved positive cash flow to date. In July, we announced a five-year contract with DHL to operate two 737-400 cargo aircraft. I'm very pleased to tell you that both of those aircraft are currently in service today. In October, we announced that although the PSP program had ended, we would not furlough any employees to the end of the calendar year. We accomplished this through a combination of a pilot agreement for reduced hours, a significant number of voluntary crew leaves, and a reduction of hours for administrative personnel. Again, I'd like to thank all of our people for supporting each other and the company in this endeavor. In November, we entered into an agreement with United to prepay us $85 million to be used to pay down debt on existing aircraft, which enabled us to maximize our treasury loan. Also in November, we finalized and closed a $195 million loan under the CARES Act with the U.S. Treasury Department. And lastly, in November, we amended our American Capacity Purchase Agreement to extend 40 CRJ-9 aircraft for five years. Truly, in my mind, a remarkable accomplishment given the environment. We remain focused on our primary business with our existing partners and opportunities 
to grow our business with them. We are also pursuing a number of new opportunities that we believe could provide the company additional long-term growth, diversification, and enhanced earnings. I'd like to turn it over to Brad Rich to give you an update on our level of operations, as well as on our American, United, and DHL operations. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I will begin with an update of our block hour production. Uh, for the September quarter, we generated 57,622 block hours, which is about 50% of the pre-COVID level. Based on current guidance with our partners, we expect the December quarter to be at about 60% of pre-COVID levels and roughly 70% for the March quarter. Uh, based on high-level projections from one of our partners, we believe block hour utilization will continue to increase, increase and reach pre-COVID levels by the end of the calendar year. Um, I'd now like to provide an update on our American uh, operation relationship. We recently amended our CPA to operate 40 of our CRJ-900 aircraft for a term of five years. Our current fleet, as many of you know, is 64 CRJ-900s, uh, and that will reduce to 63 in June of 2021. Of these 63 aircraft, we own 48, and 41 of those are financed under our recently announced U.S. Treasury loan. We also have 15 aircraft leased through 2024. We will be using the majority of these aircraft to support the American operation. However, we are reviewing several new opportunities that would productively utilize some of these aircraft. Uh, given the attractive financing and low debt balance on a majority of the fleet, we believe these aircraft are valuable assets and will remain productive. Uh, additionally, American has requested that we pick up additional flying over the first half of calendar year 2021 over and above the new CPA levels. Although we've not formalized an agreement, we believe this could result in three to five additional lines of flying. Um, obviously, this new agreement uh, with American was extremely important to Mesa. Uh, getting it done in this difficult and challenging environment was not easy, and we are excited and pleased to continue our relationship with American that began over 30 years ago. Um, I would like to thank American Eagle leadership, um, uh, including Devin May, Mark Mosner, and George, uh, uh, George Stahl, Staley, uh, for their hard work and support. Uh, we did offer rates uh, that we believe are competitive and appropriate considering the reduced aircraft ownership previously discussed. Uh, this agreement also demonstrates our ability to provide rates that we believe are industry leading. Uh, now moving to an update of our United operation. As, John, as Jonathan pointed out, uh, we've already added 10 new Embraer 175 LL air aircraft that are scheduled and are scheduled to add six more this month. The last four will be delivered in the first half of calendar year 2021. As we add these aircraft to the United fleet, we are removing our CRJ 700s on a one-for-one -one basis. These aircraft will be leased to another United operator on a seven-year term. We are retraining most of the uh, current CRJ 700 pilots in Dulles on the Embraer 175, and most of that training expense will be covered by the training credits that are part of the purchase agreement. Within the next six months, we will be operating a single fleet of 80 Embraer 175s with United, which will enhance operational performance and improve cost efficiencies. In regards to our cargo operations, we have two 737-400 cargo aircraft in service with DHL. Both aircraft are based in Cincinnati where we have a pilot domicile and a maintenance base. So far, we have been pleased with the operation and believe we are well positioned to grow this line of business. Uh, with that, I'd now like to turn it over to Mike Lott to walk through our financial performance. Great, thanks, Brad. Uh, let me give a quick recap on the earnings uh, for the fourth quarter, fiscal 2020. We reported net income of 11.4 million, or 32 cents per share. 
Uh, this compares the net income of $12.2 million for the same quarter last year, or $0.35 cents, uh, per diluted share. Uh, as noted in our press release, the Q4 2020 results include, per gap, the deferral of $7.8 million of CPA revenue, all of which was billed and paid by American and United during the quarter and will be recognized over the remaining term of the CPAs. During the quarter, we also recognized $40.8 million as an offset to wages related to the previous announced PSP program. We did report $3.2 million of income tax expense for the quarter. However, we did not pay any cash taxes as we have over $500 million of valuable NOL carry forward. For the full year 2020, we reported net income of $27.5 million or $0.78 cents per diluted share compared to $47.6 million or $1.36 per diluted share last year. As noted in our press release also, the 2020 results include, again, per GAAP, the deferral of $23.8 million of CPA revenue, um, which was uh, deferred and would be recognized over the uh, remaining term of the CPA. During the quarter, we also recognized $83.8 million as an offset to wages related to the PSP program. Of note, of the total PSP grant of $95.2 million, which initially was $92.5 million and then reallocated up to the $95.2, we recognized $83.8 million in fiscal 2020 and expect to recognize the remaining balance in the first quarter of fiscal 2021. For the year, we reported $9.5 million of income tax expense, and as we noted, we did not pay any cash taxes. Quarter over quarter, revenue was down 79.8 million or 42% from 178.7 million to 108 million. And for the year, revenue was down 178 million or 25% from 723.4 million to 545.1 million. Cash for the quarter increased by 34.5 million to 99.4. During the quarter, we had CapEx expense of $1.5 million. We also paid $34.6 million in scheduled principal payments, and we had deferred principal payments of $14 million in the quarter. In total, we have deferred uh, $28.1 million in principal payments uh, since March. I'd also like to now walk you through the uh, very important U.S. Treasury loan, which we recently closed on, which I can tell you took a lot of effort a lot of people within the company. At a high level, our total loan is $195 million. The first tranche funding was $43 million and was collateralized with existing unencumbered assets. Prior to the second tranche, we extinguished $164 million of debt to unencumber 44 aircraft using a combination of $83 million of cash on hand and $81 million of prepaid CPA revenue from United. The second tranche funding was $152 million collateralized with the 44 aircraft for a total of $195 million. Net cash generated was $31 million, which is $195 million less $164 million in debt, was, that was, in debt that was extinguished. The U.S. Treasury debt is set at LIBOR plus $350. It's interest only, while the debt that we extinguished was fully amortizing debt. As a result, as a result scheduled principal payments going forward are significantly lower if we choose not to repay the Treasury loan, which we have an option to do. To put this into context, prior to the Treasury loan, for example, fiscal year 2021 had 189 million of scheduled principal payments, which will be reduced to 96 million for a reduction of 93 million. And for fiscal 2022, scheduled principal payments are reduced from 152 million to 91 million, a reduction of 62 million. So in the next two fiscal years, scheduled principal payments are being reduced by $154 million. Also, as part of a loan agreement, we did issue 4.9 million warrants to the U.S. Treasury that were struck at $3.98. I'd like to just touch on a, a few other items. I included in the $164 million of debt that we extinguished was $21 million of the $28 million of total principal deferrals that we had through the end of the fiscal year. The remaining $7 million of deferrals, plus an additional $12 million, which we are deferring between October and July, will all be repaid in August. We also negotiated total prepayment discounts of roughly $3.5 million. At fiscal year end, we had $22.9 million outstanding under our CIT revolver, 
which we are considering repaying now that we have closed on our treasury loan. The $81 million United prepaid revenue received in November is expected to be reduced to zero by approximately February. CapEx for 2021 will primarily be our purchase of 20 engines from GE for roughly $110 million. Currently, 10 of those engines are scheduled for delivery in 2021 and 10 for 2022. We are currently in discussions with various parties on financing and lease options, as well as discussions with GE to modify the delivery schedule. Other cash items related to fiscal 2021, scheduled aircraft lease cash payments will exceed book expense by roughly $9 million. We continue to manage our vendor payments and have moved a significant number of our vendors to net 60, up from net 15 and net 30. For fiscal year 2021, we will be performing heavy maintenance that was previously deferred due to lower aircraft utilization levels in fiscal 2020. Lastly, as we look at the new American CPA terms for the 40 aircraft and the new E-175 terms for the 20 new aircraft, we expect our pre-tax margins to be consistent with the past few years. Obviously, in this environment, there are a lot of variables that, that could impact these numbers, both positively and negatively. And due to this uncertainty, we're not, we're not offering any guidance at this time. I'd like to now turn it back over to John. Thank you, Mike, and we appreciate the financial recap. At this point, operator, I'd be happy to field any questions that come from any of the listeners. Thank you, sir. At this time, if you do have any questions or comments, you may press star 1. Please unmute your phones and state your first and last name when prompted. To withdraw your question, you may press star 2. Again, star 1 for any questions. <coughs> One moment, please, for the first question. Savi Fife from Raymond James, you may go ahead. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yeah, if I could uh, help us with, with some of the deferred costs showing up and, and some of the deferred revenue happening, could you give us an idea of maybe the progression? I know, it, you know the timing of everything is not exact, but any uh, color on the progression of, of kind of the revenue build and the cost build uh, in, in fiscal year 21? Mike, do you want to do that? Hello? Yes, I got it. Thank you. Uh, sure. So, this is Abby. This is Mike. So, most of our, our, our revenue bill is going to be based on our block hour production. We did give, give, give guidance for the first two quarters. You know, third and fourth quarter is, is, is a little hard for us to predict. We, you know, we've, we've gotten some indication from our partners that um, it's going to be um, increased. But, uh, you know, we're, we're just not, not in a position right now to give give those firm block hour projections for Q3 and Q4. But, but from a revenue bill, that will, that will primarily just be driven by, by our block hours. And on the cost side, our costs are going to be fairly consistent. Um, we did have this, this deferral of, of some of our heavy maintenance on the airframes that uh, we um, deferring from, from 2020, and we're we seeing a lot of that in 2021. Do those deferrals show up in the off, should we assume, kind of the off-peak quarters, Mike, and so they're kind of heavy on those those time periods? Or And then also, do you have an update on any kind of uh, those pass-through costs, or are they uh, part of kind of the, uh, some of the other agreements? No, so, some of them are pass-through, but most of them are, are for the, the MESA, MESA responsibility. And uh, as far as timing them, I think it would be more, more likely in the front half of the year than the tail half. Makes sense. And then just one last clarification. The, the request from American that you're still working on for additional block hours flying, that, is that in the guidance or that would be above and beyond what's in the guidance? I believe that's in the guidance. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Bert Stevens with People. You may go ahead, sir. Hey, this is uh, Bert Stevens with People. Um, thanks for the time and good afternoon. Uh, over the last couple quarters, uh, you know, you've highlighted very strong controllable completion factors, you know, almost pretty much cl as close as you can get to 100 percent. What gives you confidence you can run this strong an operation when, you know, block hours start to come back and, and maybe you don't have the same degree of sparing that you have now? Um, well, I'll take a shot at it, and Brad, I'm happy to have you add into that. Um, first, on the American side, we will have, um, you know, 
significantly more spares than we've ever had. So I, I, I think, you know, we would probably be okay there. It'll just really depend on what ultimately happens with those aircraft. Um, we certainly will make sure that we have the adequate spares uh, to operate at the levels that are, you know, above and beyond. Um, and I think that having those spare aircraft allows to do that. On the United side, um, you know, we have continued to operate. Uh, we have always operated for United, you know, above any, you know, contractual requirements. You know, we've done a really good job. We have a lot of new aircraft there, and we have adequate sparing. Uh, plus, I think a big part of what goes on with United is, uh, you know, we have two big maintenance bases that allow us to see a lot of aircraft, and we don't see any real changes there. So I think we feel very confident, particularly with, uh, the, you know, the age of the fleet at United. Brad, did you want to add anything to that? I think, no, no, Jonathan, I think the two main things are, look, we're excited to, to move to a one consistent fleet of Embraer 175s on the United side, which will really enhance operational reliability, we believe. Um, and then, uh, as Jonathan already said, on the American side, uh, we will be adequately spared. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. I guess I'm uh, just wondering, you know, as some of those spares come down, you said there's potentially some productive use for some of those aircraft, if, if you expect that to have an impact or not really. I don't think we would uh, – we wouldn't jeopardize anything in American by pulling more aircraft out than, than we feel comfortable with. Um, you know, as a result of the uh, financing that's made available to us under the Treasury loan, um, these aircraft become, you know, financially much less of a burden, and having the additional spare aircraft is something uh, we want to do to continue to build. Uh, you know, even after 30 years, we continue to build the confidence of our partners, so – uh, I, I just don't think we'd let it get to that point where we uh, felt that we were not adequately spared. Well, great. Thanks. That's, that's helpful yes. color. Just, just one more uh, as a follow-up. Uh, Jonathan, last, last quarter, you, you said you think that there's greater opportunity on the regional side than the cargo side. Uh, I assume you still think that's the case, but just wonder if you had any commentary around that. Well, no, I, I think that, you know, my view on that is, um, the regional business is clearly our core business, and we do think that there continues to be uh, some very good opportunities in the regional side. Um, in terms of the cargo business, I mean, I, I think that uh, no one imagined the strength that we've seen uh, in the cargo side and, and the opportunities that exist. The, the difference there is our partners at American United and other mainline carriers um, you know, we'll do deals 10, 20 aircraft at a time, whereas on the cargo side, they have a tendency just to be a lot more incremental. And so I think uh, for that reason, um, you know, the cargo business will build, but, you know, potentially not at the same rate as we could potentially move the regional business. Um, but that being said, uh, I do think that the cargo business does provide us with uh, some pretty significant opportunity uh, but it, it just it just maybe taking a little it takes a little bit longer to develop. Um, you know, at United we we went from you know literally 20 airplanes to 80 airplanes in a matter of a few years. I just think it's going to you know to to do that kind of growth in the cargo business will take some time. Thanks for the time. Thank you. Our next question comes from Mike Lindenberg from Deutsche Bank. Sir, you may go ahead. Oh, hey, hey, everyone. Hey, Jonathan, just to, on the cargo piece, to kind of follow up on that, like, you know, when we think about how big that could be in two or three years, are we talking, what, six, eight, ten airplanes? Do you get to a dozen airplanes? Just if you can sort of frame the expectations for us, and then I have a second one. Sure. Well, um, you know, we think the 737-400 continues to have a long-term uh, attraction to the, you know, the different cargo operations. It mm -hmm. builds a very good niche. Um, we're out looking at other aircraft types as well, and I think there'll probably be movement to 737-800s at some point. Mm -hmm. We're also looking at smaller aircraft. Uh, there seems to be a great need to get, you know, more product out to more places faster, uh, you know, with the advent of overnight delivery literally to everywhere in the country, which has been, you know, exacerbated by the pandemic and I don't think is going to go away anytime soon. Um, and I think that as a result, we're going to continue to pursue what we think are a number of attractive cargo opportunities. Um, you know, how fast they develop and how quick, 
you know, I think is, is, is speculation, but um, I, I would be very surprised if we weren't, you know, significantly larger than we are today with only two aircraft in a year or two. Um, and again, uh, that's just, you know, you know, based on our existing business with, you know, our, our, our business with DHL. So, um, you know, I, I think that, that uh, like I said, the cargo operators take things a little bit more incrementally. Uh, but that being said, I think over time we can continue to build that operation nicely over the next couple of years. And, you know, I, I would like to think that, uh, you know, we could add, be nice if we could add an airplane every other month or somewhere in that kind of range. I think if we were, you know, at 10 or 12 airplanes in two years, I think we'd be pretty happy. Okay, great. And then just a question, um, Mike, you know, you gave us a lot of numbers on, you know, where you were year, uh, yeah, fiscal year end from a liquidity perspective, and you know now you've closed the other part of the loan. You talked about you know maybe paying down the CIT line of credit. How much? Um, can you just tell us how much capacity you have available on that CIT line, and maybe give us you know a ballpark, a calendar year end liquidity level, like what we what we should be kind of honing in on. Thanks. Yeah, so the 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 CIT that we have out at I think it's you know roughly twenty three or twenty four million. I mm-hmm. think that's about the 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 amount that we have collateral to support under that facility. I think the the actual facility may be for thirty five, but um, you know it, it's based on the collateral. I think we're we're probably capped at like twenty five, of which we have you know most of it drawn down. Okay. And, uh, you know based based on you know, the treasury loan and, and where we see liquidity, where, you know, we're evaluating um, just paying that, paying that down, keeping it in place, of course, but just, um, just paying it down. And year end liquidity is a little, a little tricky right now, but we're not sure how much of the um, um, United prepayment will be burned off. So um, I'd, I'd prefer to hold off on kind of predicting cash for year end right now. Okay. Very good. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, sure. Thanks. And our next question comes from Helene Becker with Cowan. You may go ahead. Um, thanks very much, Operator. Hi, everybody, and thank you very much for the time. Um, so one kind of nit question, your liabilities on the current liability line and the non-current liability line don't add up um, on the balance sheet you provided today. Uh, it's both lines are off by a little bit of money. Um, so you might want to look at that or try to figure out why they're not adding. Okay. And then my second question is um, with respect to the operation, the, the fact that you guys are running, you know, a really good on-time performance um, and, and a good operation right now, um, does that – are you getting more – more inbounds um, for people wanting from other airlines wanting to sign you up um, since you have the capacity and and you're one of the few airlines that's profitable. Um, first, let me address the first question, Helene. Since you and I have known each other a long time, is not the first time that you've pointed out an error and have been correct. <laughs> so we will certainly take a good look at that and make sure that we have the numbers right. So thank you. Oh, um, my God. I'm so sorry, Jonathan. Yeah, yeah, I feel yeah, really bad. It. It's fine. <laughs> I mean, you know, I was, I was just commenting today that when you run a big operation of any kind, uh, you know, occasionally something slips through the cracks. So let us take a look at it and make sure that we have it right. Um, <laughs> on the second question, yeah, I think that we have really, you know, established ourselves as one of the leading regional carriers and hopefully, you know, one of the leading – cargo carriers. Um, there is certainly opportunity within the regional business as other um, CPAs have aircraft that uh, are expiring. And our cost structure, we feel, is significantly below our major competitors. Um, we think that in all probability, the likelihood of them being able to catch our cost structure is very low because so much of our cost structure is based on um, the fact that You know, I think the last time I looked, half of our employees have less than two years seniority. So we have a young junior workforce that gives us some benefits there. Um, So, yeah, and I think that, you know, uh, both in the regional side and in the cargo side, when there are RFPs out there, I think Mesa will, in fact, uh, be included going forward. So I I do feel that 
uh, you know, we can win business both on our costs and also on the level of service that we can provide. Um, believe me, we know that we're being tested right now by DHL and we're doing everything can, we can to provide the highest quality business because we believe that there could be some growth uh, coming in that regard, but we know that performance is critical. So okay. I do think that it's been helpful to us, and obviously we have to build on this coming out of the pandemic to demonstrate that uh, what we've done here is, is, is building the base for us to continue to grow the business. Um, okay, that's Jonathan, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. Sorry about that, um, my addition there. But the other, the other thing I wanted to ask is, one of the things I'm starting to see a lot of in the trade press is biometrics and um, the use of that at airports and with the airlines and stuff. And I'm wondering if, if either of your two partners have talked to you about making sure all of your, you know, gates and, and um, your boarding processes are consistent with theirs as they move to that over the next few years. Well, uh, Brad, do you want to answer that? You were, you were at United. You probably have a better feel for that than I do. Any thoughts? Um, I, I apologize. Um, Helene, do you restate the question? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, no, no worries. It's just I'm seeing a lot of stuff on biometrics and, and the use of yeah. biometrics, you know, to board people. Um, and I guess we're going to that because you don't – we're going to – it looks to me like we're going to a touchless environment at airports and and so on from a health perspective even after the pandemic goes away and i'm just kind of wondering if your partners have approached you about making sure all of your airports are consistent with that um so um so the part of that obviously that we control is i mean we obviously stay in very close contact and follow the guidance of our partners as i as you well know and your question is have they approached us not with anything to the level that you've described. Um, are we making advances and progressions um, more toward the type of environment you've um, kind of described? Um, uh, certainly. Um, but how quickly uh, things continue to develop, um, at least to the extent you've described, you know, um, I'm obviously not very well uh, qualified to address other than we just keep in touch with them closely, follow what the guidance they ask. Um, and then as it relates to our own operation, our own people, of course, we're doing everything, you know, I think humanly possible to keep, um, you know, people safe in this environment. But uh, that, those are my only thoughts, Elaine. Gotcha. That's really helpful. Okay. Thanks, gentlemen. Thanks for the, Thank um, thanks for the help. Thank you. And once again, that is star one if you would like to ask a question. Our next question comes from George Steen with Core Partners. Sir, you may go ahead. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for taking my question, and, and Craig, that's been a great quarter. Um, and Mike, this question, I just wanted to, I wanted to rethink maybe something that Mike was asking is, you know, maybe if you could just give us a lens into the cash balance as of today or roughly around today, you know, where the UAL prepayment stands in gross debt. I mean, yeah. Look, we're we, we're fairly close here to the to the uh, end of the calendar year. Um, so we we look at year end cash at probably somewhere around 170 million dollars, um, of which you know probably at least half, uh, you know, 40 to 50 of that is still United prepaid cash that they have to burn off. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And can you remind me uh, of the – so that the CARES Act loan, you know, where the LTV stands on that one per the covenant? Or where are you guys landed uh, on the LTV basis for the collateral? So the, yeah, so the, the loan was based on an LTV. It was different for different types of equipment, but it was 50% uh, on aircraft, which, which the majority of our loan was based on. Uh, and the, the – uh, the test going forward is 66.2% LTV, so there is some some amount of cushion there as we as we test the collateral. I think twice a year. Mm -hmm. But I guess as of kind of round numbers today are getting close to year end, you have somewhere around 100 and 130 million to 120 million of of cash net of the net of the UAL plus. I guess you know conceivably a 
doubly collateralized CARES Act loan of 195. And I, I guess, of course, net that against the market cap of 150 million. Is that kind of do those rough numbers add up? Okay. Yep, that's correct. Okay. Um, that's it for me. Thanks. You bet. And the next question comes from Savvy Five from Raymond James. Hey guys, um, thanks for the follow up. Uh, could you talk a little bit about, you know, uh, with the American contract, you know, what's the threshold that American uh, needs to come down on their mainline fleet uh, for them to be able to take uh, take aircraft out in that first half of the year? And and also, just could you provide an update on the whitetail risk, especially if American kind of pulls out aircraft from that contract as they they're able to? Brad, do you want to do that? Uh, well, sure. Um, look, we uh, I want to be uh, a little careful here, uh, becoming a spokesman for American. In all of the discussions we've had, and Sabi, I think your question is, you know, is in the is related to the first half of 2021. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. So look, we we uh, we we in all the discussions we've had with American, um, the we think there's a, a, a threshold here of about another 40 aircraft of reduction uh, that would then trigger some uh, type of an issue with their scope. Um, but look, I, I want to be careful of that because, you know, it's Americans to describe, not us, but that's what we believe. Um, and so, uh, and if you think of, of 40 additional narrow body reductions um, in excess of the current reduction, um, you know, that's, a, that's quite a few airplanes, which we think um, would uh, be pretty minimal uh, risk for us, especially in an environment where, you know, as we mentioned, we're having um, more discussion um, about potentially additional flying above and beyond uh, the 40 aircraft. So we, we, having said all of that, we really, you know, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, of course, but we think there's relative, uh, relatively small risk um, in those first six months. Makes sense. And just kind of curious what the white – updated whitetail risks, I mean, more so because it's now the CRJ 900s, I think, have been pledged as well. Just kind of curious what the kind of updated whitetail risk is. Uh, Mike, I'm happy to make some comments, but do you want to take the tail risk part? Yeah, so what, what, what you, you talk about the uh, lease exposure? Exactly. Lease and, and yeah. debt payments that might go beyond. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, our, our, our tail risk has, has always, you know, we, we it's really related to the leased aircraft, and there's 15 of them. And I think we've, we've always said it's somewhere around 20, 25 to $30 million. And it, 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 uh, it's, a, it's a tail that occurs not out not until, uh, I think, the, the first or second calendar quarter of 2024. So that, that, that number really hasn't changed. Because, I mean, of course, the aircraft are fungible, but, uh, you know, those – those 15 aircraft are, are in the fleet. Makes sense. All right. Thank you. And at this time, I'm showing no further questions. Sir, I'll turn the call back over to you for any closing comments. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, everyone, for uh, your support of MACE over the years, and certainly through the pandemic. It's been uh, obviously challenging, um, but on the same at the same time, uh, you know, we've worked very hard to keep uh, all of our people moving in the same direction. They've been incredibly supportive. I have to tell you, I'm every day amazed at the, the work effort that people are putting in, uh, whether it's out online, um, you know, in the maintenance hangars, in dispatch, or the, the, the people who are, are, you know, working from home diligently to keep the company moving forward. Um, we think that uh, the accomplishments this quarter uh, certainly will bode well for the future. Um, I think when we look at our two main partnerships uh, with United and their support, uh, their willingness to loan a, to uh, prepay us eighty plus million dollars to help us uh, financially strengthen our balance sheet, I think is something uh, in particularly given the environment remarkable in itself. And uh, we are really pleased uh, with American and their support uh, and the work that Brad did putting that deal together. Uh, that allowed us to continue to operate those 40 aircraft with, in the American system. Um, 
those two things, uh, I think, will hopefully be indicative of, of what we're capable of doing going forward with those partners. Um, additionally, uh, the U.S. Treasury Department alone has been given us incredible flexibility with the aircraft. Um, our cash cost on the aircraft that were financed by the Treasury alone is about $11,000 a month. Um, and I think that it's important that, um, you know, while we have depreciation expense and obviously engine expense, uh, that flexibility is what allowed us to put the American deal together. Um, I'm hopeful on the cargo side that we can continue to see opportunities there. I can tell you that we have had uh, numerous inbound calls uh, regarding our cargo capability over the last few months. Uh, we, and we're looking forward to acting on, on those calls also going forward. Um, all in all, uh, you know, we, we feel much better uh, with what's happening now on the, on the world scene. Uh, and the beginning of the distribution of the vaccine, which in itself may be a business opportunity for us. Um, and I think that our partners are continuing to show their confidence. Uh, in fact, one of our partners has indicated to us at a high level that uh, they expect us to be running at almost 100% utilization by the end of the calendar year. So hopefully, uh, you know, as they say in pilot, every, all the indications are in the green and we're continuing to make progress going forward. So thank you again. Uh, always feel free to give us a call if you have any additional questions. Thank you, everybody. And thank you. This concludes today's conference call. You may go ahead and disconnect at this time.